Hello, it's Declan Costello here, ear, nose and throat consultant uh, and uh, laryngologist, um, uh, a clinician, I'm a clinician who deals with voice disorders. Uh, this is the third in a series of lectures uh, on vocal um, health. The first two were on vocal anatomy and physiology and then on uh, voice clinics and vocal surgery and how we do voice surgery. And today's lecture is about uh, vocal pathology. So assuming you have seen the previous two lectures and you are uh, familiar with vocal anatomy and vocal folds, vocal cords, and how the whole thing works and how we examine larynxes, today's lecture is gonna be primarily about um, uh, pathology, things that can go wrong, and you'll see lots of videos as you go along. So if you haven't seen the previous lectures, um, it would probably be worth you reviewing those uh, so that you can familiarize yourself with the anatomy so that you know uh, what's going on when you're looking at the screen. So let me just bring up a shared screen here so that you can see my talk while I'm going along. Good, I hope you can see that. Let me reintroduce you as always to St. Blaise, the patron saint of throats. Um, and uh, we uh, sort of touch on his uh, uh, expertise every day. We're looking at throats, uh, St. Blaise. So we talked um, uh, in the previous lecture about um, the, uh, the different nature of laryngeal pathology, various different things that can go wrong with the larynx and thinking about it in four broad categories, uh, inflammatory things, so areas of swelling, neoplastic and structural really means lumps and bumps on the vocal cords, muscle tension imbalance problems, and neuromuscular things, so issues to do with the way nerves are transmitting signals <clears throat> or to do with the way uh, the muscles are actually contracting. So we can think about neoplastic uh, lumps and bumps, um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go into those first of all. Now, vocal fold nodules are um, one of the things, I guess, that performers are most terrified of getting. Um, and I don't really know quite why uh, they're terrified of getting vocal fold nodules, but when I see a patient in clinic who may or may not have nodules, if I say that they haven't, then the, the sense of relief is absolutely enormous. And to be honest, the vast majority of the time, uh, singers do not have vocal fold nodules. Uh, there's something else going on. So let's just talk about vocal fold nodules and how they happen and uh, what the various things are that we can do to, to address them. So you'll remember from previously that when we're looking at the larynx, uh, the vocal cords, the vocal folds should look absolutely dead straight, as straight as a die. And if we look at this video here, There we go, let's play this video. You'll see that the vocal folds are not dead straight. There are little swellings right in the middle of the vocal folds and they're tending to come together just at that particular point. Yeah, so rather than the vocal folds coming together along their whole length, they're coming together just at that one particular spot. Um, it's pretty subtle. Um, but uh, those swellings uh, in this patient's case are pretty soft, so they're nice and pliable and supple. They're not firm nodules just yet, uh, but they are very definitely there. Now, just thinking about the, uh, the way nodules come about, um, they arise when the voice is being used in uh, an over-energetic way over a prolonged period of time. Uh, they don't come up overnight. So if you have a sudden problem with your voice, then that is not nodules. Um, it might be something else, and we'll come on to that in a few minutes, um, but it's not going to be nodules. Now, nodules arise over weeks or months or even years, and when you bash the vocal cords together with a huge amount of energy, you end up with little thickenings on the, on the vocal folds. It's a little bit like a callus on a foot. If you have a shoe that rubs, the skin gets thicker and thicker and thicker, um, and uh, you end up with a, a firm swelling. And, and this, a similar thing happens here. When you're bringing the vocal cords together with a lot of energy, then at one particular point, the vocal cord thickens up. And it tends to thicken up at the point where you've got the maximum force of the vocal folds coming together. And that's why they always happen at this particular spot uh, on the vocal folds. So, uh, between, so if that's the front of the larynx and that's the back, they always happen at this spot, which is just between the front third and the back two thirds, it's always right there that nodules occur. Now, the, uh, the treatment for a callus on your foot when you've got a shoe that rubs is to wear softer shoes. And the treatment for a larynx that has vocal fold nodules 
is to use the voice in a softer way, in such a way that you don't uh, bring the vocal folds together with such force and such energy. And actually, in the vast majority of cases, the vocal fold nodules will melt away and, won't, uh, and will, will cease to be a problem. Now, even if the vocal fold nodules don't uh, melt away when you're looking at the images, most people who have nodules uh, will end up, uh, even if they get a bit smaller, they will end up working around them in a much more efficient way and they will not need to have anything further done in terms of surgery or anything along those lines. So in almost all cases of vocal fold nodules, it is not the end of your career, don't panic, and it also mean, and, and the treatment of it is not surgery in, in the huge majority of cases. Now, in this particular case, this lady was a singer. She played, uh, she accompanied herself on the piano singing in clubs and bars, and she used to do very long uh, sets. She would perform for three hours at a time uh, with a short break in the middle, and actually in her break, quote unquote, she would go and chat with the punters at the bar. So she was using her voice a huge, a huge amount. And she worked with uh, my speech therapy colleagues and she did very well in reducing the amount of uh, energy and force that she was using her voice with. She changed her set, she changed the um, mix of the different um, songs that she was performing, but still the nodules were a problem. And, and when you have nodules, they tend to give you problems in terms of vocal stamina, the voice sounds husky, <clears throat> and the voice, uh, and you have problems with your upper registers. So the, the upper registers typically break or sometimes just don't come out at all. So she was having all of those problems. So she was one of those very few people who have nodules who actually do need to have an operation. Now this is her operation. So um, we've now, if you remember from the previous lecture on uh, vocal surgery, this is now an image with her asleep. So she's lying down with a tube in her mouth and we're looking from top down. We're looking down uh, as if we're looking towards her feet off in that direction. And um, the, so this is now the other way up. So this is now the front and this is the back. This is her left vocal fold and this is her right vocal fold. And this plastic bit of plastic tubing in her throat is uh, a breathing tube, an endotracheal tube uh, that is keeping her breathing during the operation. And you can see the tube is not all that big and it, it's well out of the way. So the, the vocal fold nodules are now much more obvious. Now there are various different ways of removing vocal fold nodules. I'm just going to show you what I do, which is we've got, I showed you in the last uh, lecture, the instruments that we have, which are basically long, they're about a foot long, um, and they have grasping things and there's various scissors and this and that. And for nodules, this is what I tend to do. I, I literally just grab the thing and use a scissors on, on, on the end of a stick to, uh, to cut the nodules out. So this, the, here comes the scissors. Uh, about to remove the nodules. Now the key thing with this is not to leave a great big crater in the vocal fold. You want to leave the edge of the vocal fold straight at the end so that when it heals over, um, it heals over with epithelium, with lining of the vocal fold that isn't going to get tethered onto the underlying ligament. So that's the right vocal fold nodule having been uh, removed. It looks like there's an awful lot of blood there, doesn't it? There really isn't. Bear in mind that the vocal fold in this lady is only a centimeter and a half long. So um, that blood that looks pretty dramatic there is really not at all dramatic. And um, uh, this is me just putting a little bit of adrenaline uh, on a gauze just to sort of sample. And this is what it looks like at the end of the operation. So you remove the nodules from both sides and uh, leave nice straight edges to the vocal folds. And what you want to see, of course, is that when she comes back to clinic, the vocal folds are nice and pliable and supple and they're coming together well. Um, and this is her post-operatively. So the vocal fold nodules have now gone. So the vocal folds look really nice and straight. And when she produces uh, her voice, when she says E, you can see them coming together well along their whole length. And you can see that they're nice and pliable and supple. That mucosal wave that we talked about in the previous lecture is now there. Um, this is her. There we go, nice and pliable and supple, and she uh, is back to performing and has had no further problems. So nodules, uh, just we're going to park nodules there, but nodules are not the end of your career. They will almost certainly not need an operation. They will get better if you modify how you're using your voice. And by the way, that isn't just in how you're using your voice with singing, but it's about the social things, nights out, pubs, bars, clubs, restaurants, that sort of thing. But if the worst comes to the worst, if you do need to have an operation to remove the nodules, then uh, it, the likelihood is that you will not have any further problems after that if the operation is done in the right way. 
So here's a slightly different scenario. This is a chap who uh, is a salesman by day and sings with a band by night, and he uh, has a, a problem with his falsetto. So let's just play this video. Um, now, he was sent to me uh, as uh, possibly having nodules. Now, you can see at, f oh, come on, you can see at first glance why somebody might have thought he might have nodules, uh, because as you look at it, there appears to be a little swelling on the front of each of the vocal folds. You could see that perhaps there's a swelling there and perhaps there's a swelling there. Let me let this video play. And this chap was referred by a colleague elsewhere. So you could be forgiven for thinking that these are bilateral swellings, that there's one on each side. But in fact, if you look closely, you'll see that there is more of a swelling on the left side, on this side, than there is on the right side. And this actually is a tiny, tiny little polyp. Let's just let this video play. So you get it with this very high quality, with the very high quality optics of the chip, chip endoscope that, you, yeah, that we described in a previous lecture, you get really nice images and you can see that there's a tiny little polyp in the middle of the left vocal fold. Now this is him having his operation because that, a polyp arises as a result of a single episode of trauma, generally speaking, a big cough or a big yell uh, or, you know, a, a big, uh, big night out or a big shout at the football match or whatever else. And this is tiny. This is a, a millimetre or so in size. Um, but it's causing him problems with his falsetto specifically. And uh, we'll, I'll come on to the falsetto thing in just a minute. But po so the key thing to know about polyps is that they don't come up over a long period of time. Unlike nodules, they come up generally as a single thing. So if there's a if you if there's a single episode where you're using your voice very energetically and it suddenly sounds not quite right, that is more likely to be a polyp than nodules. Now, um, a polyp. Uh, will uh, sometimes go away of its own accord, but very often not, and sometimes will require surgery. And the particular reason that he was having difficulty uh, with his falsetto is because it, it's right on the free edge of the vibrating surface of the vocal fold. His speaking voice was actually fine. And if he wasn't in a band that was performing, you know, the Bee Gees and the Darkness and stuff that required him to sing in falsetto, then he would be absolutely fine. But it's the fact that he has, he relies that for producing his falsetto, he's reliant on a very clean, crisp edge of the inner vocal folds coming together along their whole length. Um, and in his case, with this tiny little blemish, even though it's only about a millimetre or so in size, that tiny blemish is enough to cause him problems uh, with his falsetto. Um, now, uh, this is clearly benign, it's nothing to worry about, and if you left it on its own, it would probably remain much the same. And as far as his speaking voice is concerned, and as far as his career in, um, uh, in sales is concerned, it's not really a problem, but it is impeding his ability to sing uh, in his band. So, he did have an operation. This is him asleep now, so again, this is the front of his larynx, this is the back, left vocal fold and right vocal fold, tiny, tiny polyp, and there's just a little bit of redness on the other side, because of course this thing is bashing up, this thing on the left is bashing up against the right side hundreds of times a second, so it's not surprising that there's a little bit of swelling on the other side. He's had that polyp removed, there it is, gone, and he comes back to clinic uh, a little while later, and again what you want to see is that the swelling has gone, and you want the, um, the pliability, the suppleness uh, to have come back and the mucosal wave to have been restored. So interestingly, actually, the right vocal fold looks fine. That tiny little blemish on the left vocal fold is gone as well. Here comes the stroboscopy. And again, really nice, pliable, supple mucosal wave. That's what you want to see. And he, uh, he's off into the distance and he's absolutely fine. And as we said in the previous lecture, <clears throat> he would have been able to go back to singing probably about six weeks after his surgery because uh, everything's healed up so well. So that's a really very important distinction there in those two conditions between a polyp, which comes up quite suddenly, and polyps vary in shape and size. That was a tiny one. You can see huge ones elsewhere. Um, and uh, uh, that, so that's the polyp is sudden thing, whereas vocal fold nodules happen over a prolonged period of time. So here we go. This is another um, uh, lesion on the vocal folds. <laughs> So this chap had been um, wondering what was going on with his voice for a little while. It wasn't entirely uh, 
surprising because uh, he had a husky voice. It wasn't entirely surprising to hear that he had something wrong, but he's clearly got really quite a substantial swelling here arising. It looks to me as if it's arising from the upper surface of his left vocal fold. Um, and that is the kind of thing that is just not going to go away of its own accord. With the previous one, that's just a millimetre or two in size, if that has only just come up in the last few weeks, you could argue, well, leave it be, see how you go over the next six or eight or 12 weeks. <clears throat> and if, if the thing melts away of its own accord, great. This is of a sufficient size that that's just not going to disappear on its own. So again, he had surgery to remove the thing. And this is a couple of weeks afterwards. So what you want to see again is that the lump is gone. Um, you'll notice that the left vocal fold looks a little bit on the pink side. That's fine. It's relatively early days uh, and this swelling will gradually settle down. But again, the pliability, because it's a fairly big lesion, the pliability is coming back, uh, albeit not perfect at the moment, but it is uh, the suppleness is returning. So polyps come up suddenly. Nodules come up over a period of time. This is another scenario entirely. This is a soprano who developed a sudden onset of hoarseness while singing. Now, you don't need me to tell you that this is clearly pretty abnormal. That's the left vocal fold. That's the right vocal fold. The right vocal fold looks like it's bruised, and it is. It's got a big bruise all the way along the length of it. <clears throat> and uh, that's a vocal fold hemorrhage. In other words, one of the blood vessels within the vocal fold has popped and caused blood to, to, to spread along the surface of the vocal fold or the under the surface of the vocal fold, I should say, all the way along. It's like if you've got a, a thread vein and you knock it on your leg, it can cause a big bruise. Now, this is not painful. Incidentally, none of what we've seen before, polyps, nodules, this kind of thing, not painful. In fact, you wouldn't be aware of anything in your throat at all. The only thing you would be aware of is hoarseness. But this woman was rehearsing and experienced a sudden change in the quality of her voice. Now, um, this may have happened because there was a prominent blood vessel on the surface of the vocal fold that has popped. And if you look closely, you'll see that actually on the left vocal fold, there are a few little prominent vessels here and here. And it may be that she's got something similar on the right side, on this side, that has suddenly just opened up and popped and caused the vocal fold hemorrhage. We can't really tell that at the moment because the whole thing is full of bruise, full of blood. This is a very difficult scenario because um, what we want to happen is for that bruise, that hemorrhage to resolve over a period of time in such a way that you restore the pliability and that they, you don't get scarring and tethering. I'll just let this video play. Okay, that's it. Um, so the, you, you, you want really for the, um, uh, the pliability to come back in the long term. Now, what we don't know as, as ENT surgeons and in the research community, we don't know whether a period of voice rest, complete voice rest, um, followed by building your voice up is the right thing to do, or whether you should be singing on this straight away. Now, the concern from our side is that if you sing when there is that bruise there, there is the possibility, we feel, that you might end up with scarring where the lining of the vocal fold won't um, uh, maintain its pliability and might end up getting stuck down onto the underlying ligament and if that happens if that scarring happens you then lose the pliability and the suppleness of the vocal folds and that leads to long-term problems with hoarseness and, and ongoing voice issues so um, as, a, as an ENT, as a laryngology community, we have sort of come to the view that in this situation patients probably should rest their voice completely and then wait until the hemorrhage has uh, resolved, wait until the bruise has gone away, have another look at the larynx, and then if there's a prominent blood vessel that might have popped, then you have a conversation about whether you uh, zap that blood vessel with a laser or whether there's anything else that needs to be done. Now the problem here is that in order for you to watch what's going on and to see whether the hemorrhage is going to resolve, you're talking about resting the voice for probably a period of at least two weeks, complete silence for two weeks while you watch the hemorrhage resolve, then having a further examination of the larynx with an endoscope uh, to see whether it has settled down completely and whether there's a problem with blood vessel. And then at that stage, you may be talking about having surgery to deal with any prominent blood vessels that were there 
and, and set the whole thing off in the first place. And if you are going to have surgery, then you're talking about a period of six or eight weeks of rehabilitation after that. So <clears throat> this situation is very difficult and could potentially mean that a singer is going to be out of commission for a number of months while this is looked at, re-examined, and then maybe uh, dealt with surgically. So this is one of the more difficult um, areas that we, that we deal with. Now, there are very few situations in which I say that patients should completely rest their voices. I say after surgery, as you might know from the previous lecture, after surgery, I say that patients should rest their voices completely for two days after, um, uh, and then they gradually build up their voices. But as you know, I would then recommend that people go back to singing at about the six week stage, so relatively quickly. In this situation, you may be talking about a number of months before the performer can go back, and that's a very difficult thing to, uh, to get your head around. So here's another soprano. There seem to be a lot of sopranos here today. Um, this is um, a, yes, yeah, so this is an interesting one. This is a lady who um, is a full-time professional singer, choral singer, uh, and she has had problems with her voice since a, uh, a fairly sudden onset uh, a number of months previously, but she's had to carry on singing. She's just about muddled through, but her voice is uh, a little bit hoarse, including her speaking voice is a little bit hoarse. It never goes back to normal, and that starts ringing alarm bells. If somebody's voice never goes back to normal, then that implies that there probably is a physical thing on the vocal cords causing the problem. Um, and uh, she's having problems with her upper registers. Uh, and you know, typically if you get a very subtle little swelling on the inner surface of the vocal fold, that will cause problems with the upper registers as we saw a second ago with the falsetto uh, in, in the band singer. So this is this lady who has carried on singing in spite of having problems. Now, there are a few things that uh, immediately uh, jump out at me as I look at this. Um, the first thing is that there are a few kind of spits and spots of little prominent blood vessels here and here and here. I don't really know what the significance of those is to be honest, because you, it's, it's pretty common to see prominent blood vessels or little uh, reddish areas on vocal folds that are of no significance at all. In a lot of people who have no vocal problems, uh, you might see these things anyway. But just worth noting. So as I go in, the other thing I think, and this is really subtle, but the other thing is I just wonder whether there's a little bit of swelling on this side, a little bit of swelling on this side. It's all very diffuse and there's no single thing that you can put your finger on but it's, there's just some sort of diffuse swelling just as you're looking at that with the, with the still image. Here comes the stroboscopy. So on the stroboscopy, you can see there's a little bit of sticky mucus here and there. The vocal folds aren't quite coming together completely. The, um, there is perhaps just a little bit of stiffness on both sides, sticky mucus, as I say. Um, so my, my reading of all of this was that it wasn't completely clear to me what was going on actually at this point. And sometimes you have to say to yourself, well, you know, we know that there's some swelling. We know there are a few little bits and bobs that we need to address. And uh, we need to tidy up your larynx, for want of a better phrase. Um, and in this situation, I uh, recommended actually that she step back from her singing. She was lucky enough to be able to step into a different role. Uh, where she didn't have to perform and she took the pressure right off her voice. Uh, I gave her some anti-reflux treatment because she had uh, some reflux and a couple of weeks later this is what her larynx looked like. Now at this stage uh, it is a little bit more obvious what's going on. If you look really closely here you will see that there is actually, whoops, see Daisy, there is actually just a tiny little, uh, it's just, there we go. It's not the clearest image, but there is a tiny little blemish, tiny little blemish in the middle of the right vocal fold. So that prominent thing there is actually, I believe, a tiny polyp. Now you will also see that there's a little bit of a swelling on this left side. And my interpretation of this was that actually there was a thing on this side and uh, just a little bit of contact swelling on the other side. And there are discussions that are had amongst the ENT surgeons about whether you remove swellings from both sides or just one. Actually, my reading in this occasion was that we would just need to remove that right side and the left side would settle down of its own accord. So this is her um, at the end, this is her having her operation. It's now much more obvious. You've got a little kind of 
tiny hemorrhagic polyp, again, about a millimeter or so in size, and sort of diffuse swelling of the left side. But if you just remove that side, then that left side is going to get better of its own cord. That's her immediately after the end of her operation. And you know the, the same story applies post-operatively. You want the pliability to have come back. There you go. So pliability is there on the right side, uh, and no, and uh, she's gone back to singing and and uh, all is well. This is um, a pop singer who has not sung for a number of years and uh, it's not particularly difficult to see what the issue is with this chap. So as we look down at his larynx, we're seeing, uh, come on, as we look down at his larynx, we're seeing um, uh, a swelling of the front part of his uh, left vocal fold. So here, it, this is uh, left vocal fold, right vocal fold, and this area here, uh, looks abnormal, the right side looks okay actually, but you can also, if you look closely, you can see a tiny little blood vessel streaking along from the front, from the anterior commissure, going, looks like it's going right into this area. Um, he uh, has had problems with his uh, voice, his, his voice is hoarse essentially, and again, he's having problems with his upper registers. And you know, at this stage, it's a little bit difficult for me to know, is this a polyp, is this something else? It looks a bit like a, a hemorrhagic polyp, but it looks like it ha might have a bit more blood in it than that. But either way, you know there's a blood vessel here. And that this, because this is reddish, and because you can see a blood vessel going towards it, uh, you'd be keen to treat the blood vessel and whatever this is. Now, there are, there are occasions when you can't actually make a diagnosis as to precisely what's going on um, just by looking at the larynx in the clinic. And sometimes the only way of knowing precisely what's going on is by bringing the patient to the operating theatre and then you can get stuck right in, you can feel the vocal folds and then make uh, some decisions as to what you're going to do next. So he came to the operating theatre on the basis that we figured that he was going to have some laser treatment to uh, that prominent blood vessel and we were going to work out what that swelling was and treat it accordingly. So here he is asleep. That's the, so again, we're now all the other way up. So that's the front of his larynx, that's the back of his larynx. This metal, this is a metal tube now, this is a laser tube because you can't put a plastic tube in somebody's throat if you're gonna use a laser because it might catch fire. So we use metal tubes in people who are having laser laryngeal surgery. And this is the prominent blood vessel that we saw before. It looks a bit more obvious now, doesn't it? And this is the swelling. So there are, there are different kinds of lasers that can be used in different situations in the larynx. On this occasion, I used um, a, a laser called the potassium titanyl phosphate KTP laser, and that's very good for uh, getting rid of prominent blood vessels. It does, it, uh, the way it works is that it, it, um, the, the energy, the, the, um, the, the force of the laser is absorbed by the blood, so it just gets rid of blood, but it doesn't cause too much in the way of charring and burning around the area because actually a lot of other lasers do cause quite a lot of burning so this is the uh, lay i've used the laser now to go blip, 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 and get rid of the blood vessel and then i need to work out what this swelling is now as it turns out it was a cyst um, and i had to make a cut on the upper surface of the vocal fold here and i then had to try and shell the cyst out um, which was um, a bit of a fiddle and as you can see there's a little bit of the epithelium a little bit of the mucosa uh, missing here that's fine that's actually going to heal over really just over the course of a few days and here he is post-operatively <laughs> So again, that left vocal fold is still looking a bit stiff because it's relatively early days, but in the fullness of time, that is going to come back uh, absolutely fine. And there's no, uh, it, there's no, obviously there's no swelling left there and, and the prominent blood vessel has gone away. Again, slightly pinkish looking left vocal fold post-operatively, but that's fine, that's going to settle. So let's just talk about a few uh, sort of common scenarios that arise. Um, and uh, questions I'm asked quite frequently in clinic as to whether it's okay to do this and that and how to treat some common conditions. So I guess the most common thing I'm asked is, if I have a sore throat, can I sing? Well, you know, I hate to break it to you, but I haven't got a magic answer as to uh, 
um, uh, the, the correct way of dealing with that situation. Um, the, you basically, um, if you have a sore throat, then uh, you, should do, you should just ramp up all of the stuff that you're normally doing to look after your vocal health. So steaming, drinking plenty of water. The one thing I would say is that if, if your voice is hoarse, if it's actually husky, then there is quite a strong argument for you not singing. Because it, at the point when your voice is hoarse, the implication is that your vocal folds are swollen. And um, if the vocal folds are swollen, you don't really know whether they're just swollen a little bit because you've got a cold, whether they're actually swollen and pink and beefy because they're properly infected. And you sort of want to make uh, a judgment as to whether it's okay to sing in either of those situations. So if you're actually hoarse, then that really, I suspect, would be the time to stop singing. But in a, in the, in a professional singer's career, they will be presented multiple times with a scenario where, you know, they've got a sore throat, but they've got a show tonight. You can't cancel every show when you've got a bit of a sore throat because most of the time it'll be above the level of the vocal folds it'll be in the pharynx sometimes a bit of viral tonsillitis or what have you and in that situation if the vocal cords themselves aren't affected that's absolutely fine you can carry on singing it's not practical for you guys as singers to be coming and seeing an ENT surgeon every time you get a sore throat so as you go through your career singers tend to come to a sort of uh, a thought process as to when it's okay to sing and when it's not so the, the other thing that's worth saying is that pain after you sing is very, rel, very rarely a sinister feature. It's, I quite commonly see singers who say, you know, at the beginning of a rehearsal, the beginning of a show, it's fine. But as, as the show goes on, it feels more and more achy and sore. Um, and then after the show, when I've relaxed down, the, the pain settles down. That is, excuse the noises in the next room, that is almost always a sign of uh, muscular tension rather than um, a sign of anything concerning or sinister going on at the level of the vocal folds. Um, so let's just talk about some other uh, sort of slightly crazier things and then I'll talk about some general medical conditions as well. So you've seen some really, really subtle stuff in relation to singers. This is a condition called vocal cord granuloma. Now, a granule, you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that this socking great big thing here is abnormal. Now, vocal cord granulomas happen. They always happen at the back part of the larynx. The, the epicenter is about there. So on the opposite side, the epicenter is about there. This thing it always happens on the vocal process of the arotenoid cartilage. And they happen when you get a little bit of exposed area of cartilage here. So this, the cartilage is normally lined by epithelium. At this point and if for whatever reason the epithelium is brushed off you get exposed cartilage underneath and that then for some reason that then forms this hugely over exaggerated inflammatory response called a granuloma and in this chap's case the exposure of the uh, cartilage happened because he had a, uh, an operation for a broken ankle so he was on holiday broke his ankle, had to have a general anaesthetic for, uh, to fix his broken ankle. And uh, the anaesthetist who looked in his throat, looked in with a laryngoscope and put a tube in his throat. And on, as the tube was going in, it just very lightly brushed the arotenoid vocal process as it was going in and uh, took the surface lining of the epithelium off. And that, that then led to this hugely over exuberant uh, reaction with the granuloma. Now, you know, tens of thousands of operations happen in the UK every year. And this arising is very unusual. Um, the thing about these is that they are uh, a reaction to exposed cartilage. And the temptation as a surgeon, when you see one of these is to think, great, well, I'll cut it out and it'll be gone. But actually the trouble with doing that is that you, when you cut it out, you expose even more cartilage and it comes, the thing comes back even bigger. So this chap, when I saw him, had already had three operations to try to remove it. And every time it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's typically what happens here. So for vocal cord granulomas, uh, the trick is to do nothing if you can possibly avoid it um, and just to monitor them. And they will almost always melt away. They can take months or even years to go away, but they will almost always go away. Now, interestingly, with this guy, his voice was actually fine. He had a little bit of discomfort in his throat. So, so these granulomas are often a bit painful on the side that they arise from. But his voice was fine. Now, the issue for him was that he was a very keen um, cyclist and this is the, you can see that this granuloma is quite a decent size and it's causing him a little bit of bother in terms of his breathing when he's exercising. 
Now, um, as I said, I am a very keen non-surgical advocate when it comes to vocal cord granulomas. Um, but there comes a time sometimes when you have to do something to try to address this. So there are various things for these very advanced granulomas uh, that have been very difficult to treat. There's a variety of different surgical things that have been suggested. And um, I tried a number of different things. I removed it, I injected some steroids into it. And eventually what I did was to inject Botox into his vocal cord, which basically caused a paralysis of one of his vocal cords for a period of a few weeks. And then the thing just went away because he wasn't bringing his vocal cords together. Because the treatment of these is to avoid the vocal cords bashing together, coming together at all possible if you can. So that means addressing things like throat clearing, vocal abuse in terms of shouting, prolonged voice usage. And the other thing that we think is important in these uh, is reflux, because you want to remove any potential source of irritation that might continue this thing going. So if you can address the reflux with anti-acid medications, with lifestyle measures, very importantly, to so avoiding spicy foods and all that sort of thing, and, um, uh, and, and avoiding throat clearing, then those are, those are really important aspects. So vocal cord granuloma, granuloma is unusual, um, uh, uh, but uh, treatable. But you, the, the, the trick is actually generally to leave them alone. And that, by the way, they're not malignant in any way at all. They're always at the same spot in the larynx. Uh, and I try to avoid them, uh, try to avoid biopsying them if I possibly can. So this is just another example of a vocal cord polyp. You've seen a couple of tiny polyps. So this chap was at a football match and yelled. There you go. He's got a really fairly obviously chunky um, hemorrhagic polyp of the middle of the left vocal fold. Now, that is not going to go away of its own accord, and it's not going to go away with voice therapy. Having said that, he doesn't have to have an operation if he doesn't want one. He's perfectly at liberty to leave that. Um, it just means that he'll be left with a husky voice. The only symptom he's got is a hoarse voice. He's got no pain. He's got no feeling of a lump in his throat. He's got no tickle or irritation or anything like that purely about having a hoarse voice. Um, now that would be great fun to remove because uh, it's sitting there and you just get your grasping thing, pull it carefully and then uh, snip it off at the base and that would be extremely satisfying to remove. Um, now um, I'm going to talk just for a minute now about a condition called laryngeal papillomatosis. Uh, laryngeal papillomatosis is uh, a condition in which you get growths of warts on the vocal cords. And they are warts very similar to the warts that you can get on hands or feet or genital warts or kind of wart, uh, anal warts for, for that matter. And they're caused by the same virus caused by HPV. Now let's just watch this video. Th this is a condition where you get crops of these warts occurring at a variety of different places in the larynx. You never get, well, rarely get just one lump of papilloma. Uh, it normally happens as a sort of diffuse thing with, with crops of warts around the place. So you can see in this case, this patient has got not, these, are, these vocal folds are not normal. And this is a whole crop of papilloma sitting right up at the front part of the larynx. Um, and this causes hoarseness, um, clearly, uh, and uh, they, they will have significant problems. So that's the cr cr crop of papilloma that I think is probably predominantly arising from the right side, from this side of the larynx, rather than the left. Um, now, papillomatosis is very difficult to treat. Um, we, as surgeons, what we often do is to remove the papilloma, and there are lots of different ways of removing the papilloma, and I'll talk about that. Um, but like warts elsewhere, they tend to come back. And papilloma patients, uh, when, when we first have a conversation with them in clinic, um, we're often saying that you're going to need to have multiple operations over the space of many years to come. There isn't yet any single thing that we can do to make the papilloma go away forever. Um, and uh, patients are usually, it's, in my practice, they usually have an operations about every 18 months or two years or thereabouts. Um, and the trick is to remove um, as much of the papilloma as you can. But of course, bearing in mind that if you carve out a huge amount of the papilloma and potentially some vocal cords, you're going to scar the vocal cords. So if the, these patients do end up having multiple operations as the years go by, and my job when I'm operating on them is to make sure that I remove enough that we're going to get their voice back, but that I'm not so aggressive with my surgery that I carve deep into the vocal cords and cause scarring. But if somebody's had, you know, 10, 20, 30 operations, it is inevitable that there is going to be a bit of scarring 
of the vocal folds. Um, and you, it's a surgical balance to decide which is more of a problem. Is, is the papilloma more of a problem or the scarring more of a problem? Um, now, more recently, uh, we have started giving Gardasil. Now, Gardasil is a jab that uh, is now being given to all boys and all girls in the UK by the National Health Service. And Gardasil protects you against four different types of papilloma. There are... Um, uh, there are lots, uh, dozens, hundreds of different types of, of papilloma, but the ones that typically affect the larynx are types 6 and 11. And the Gardasil jab is now being given to all boys and girls to protect against cervical cancer predominantly, because that's the main uh, health concern about, uh, larynx, uh, about uh, papillomatosis and, and, and um, uh, human papillomavirus, because it's the human papillomavirus uh, that causes uh, these papillomas. Um, but the human papillomavirus, the HPV vaccine, Gardasil, is now being given to all boys and girls in the country. And uh, there was a, a large campaign um, uh, over the years, sort of 2016 to 2018, where we as a community, we as an ENT community, were begging the government to give boys the uh, laryngeal papilloma vaccine, or rather the, the HPV vaccine, I should say, the Gardasil, and we were successful in that. So all boys and girls have now had it. But um, the, the thing is that the, with, the, with the laryngeal papillomatosis, um, we, we now feel that anyone who has laryngeal papilloma should also get the Gardasil. And um, that is a position that the British Laryngological Association has um, uh, proposed. Uh, and if you look at the British Laryngological Association website, you will see um, a position statement where we have recommended that all patients with laryngeal papilloma should have the Gardasil jab. Now you might say to yourself, what's the point in having a vaccine against something when you've already got the thing sitting there? Well, we know from a number of studies that uh, the, uh, the time gap between operations is longer if you've had the, the Gardasil jab. And we know also that in some cases, when you've had the jab, the papilloma just melts away and goes and you never need to have another operation. The Gardasil jab is extremely safe. All children in the country have it. So there's absolutely no reason not to be giving it to adults who have laryngeal papillomatosis. So when I see a patient with papilloma, I advise that they have uh, the Gardasil jab. And actually for people who are born uh, after about sort of 2003, it's really not going to be an issue because everybody's going to have it anyway. So what's so bad about smoking? I mean, we, we know that smoking is bad, and I'm sure that none of you guys are singers smoke. This is a patient with a condition called Renke's edema. Now, this is um, a condition in which you get swelling on the under, uh, on the uh, sort of superficial lamina propria, the Renke's space, uh, which is the line, the area underneath the lining of the vocal cord. So they end up with these baggy, floppy vocal cords. This is a long way from being normal, isn't it? These look like sort of balloons flopping in and out of the larynx. Um, and the, uh, as this patient phonates, he's got a terrible voice. He, his voice is husky. His voice is husky, his voice is deep in pitch, um, and uh, it's uh, this condition, it's called Renke's edema because you get edema, which is swelling, in Renke's space. And you remember from the first lecture that Renke's space is the space under the epithelium, it's just under the surface lining. So you get this boggy uh, swelling under the surface lining of the vocal cord uh, in Renke's space. And uh, this causes the voice to become husky. And it also causes the voice to drop in pitch. And that's, you know, for, for a man who has, uh, who is a smoker, who has a deep pitch and slightly husky voice, that's, you know, they're not generally too bothered about that. But actually for a woman who has a deep pitch voice, that's a problem because quite often women in this situation are mistaken for men on the phone. It's terribly embarrassing. This condition is exclusively brought about by smoking very rarely it's due to something else but that's extremely rare 99.99 percent of cases like this are due to smoking it's not a malignant condition it's not cancerous and it probably won't you know it won't turn into cancer 
but clearly these guys are smokers it always happens in smokers so they're at risk of other cancers anyway so the solution for Renke's edema is to stop smoking first of all if the patient stops smoking there are operations we can do to remove some of that swelling from the vocal cords um, but if they carry on smoking the swelling is just going to come back so we as ENT surgeons wouldn't even contemplate operating on a larynx unless the patient had committed to giving up smoking and was, was not going to take it up again. So what else is so bad about smoking? Well, this is a patient with a large laryngeal cancer. Again, this is a larynx that is a long, long way from being normal. Uh, let me just, uh, I'll find the relevant bit to show you. Okay, so just to orientate you, this is the right half of the larynx. This is the left half of the larynx. That in the distance is the right vocal cord, which looks reasonably normal, but this, all of this white, irregular, angry looking stuff, this is all cancer. And it's cancer that's affecting uh, probably the vocal cord, although you can't see the vocal cord on that left side, but it's certainly affecting the epiglottis, it's affecting the arytenoids at the back of the larynx, it's affecting the aryepiglottic fold, which is this fold that comes along here. So this is a bulky cancer, of the left side of the larynx and the patient's going to need um, some further testing, certainly going to need a biopsy to confirm it's cancer uh, and it's going to need scans and various other things to decide what to do. Now one of the concerns in this situation is that this person hasn't actually got all that much space to breathe through. You can see that this is the uh, right side, uh, th this is the, the airway, the sort of chink of airway they've got, so they've got a significant restriction of their airway, so they're probably going to be making a noise known as stridor strider is this it's uh, 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 and it happens when you've got a narrowing at the level of the vocal cords or above and that's a worrying sound um, so uh, this is this is somebody who needs urgent attention from uh, an ENT surgeon and uh, will be uh, having a, probably an operation to take some biopsies to work out exactly what's going on because the cancer doctors definitely won't provide any treatment until it's actually confirmed it's cancer. And then if this is an advanced cancer, they may be going on to have an operation to remove the entire voice box and that's an operation called the laryngectomy. So let's talk about vocal cord paralysis. Um, uh, you've seen normal larynxes. Patient phonates, and when they breathe, when they breathe, the vocal folds move apart. So this is them uh, phonating normally. Take a deep breath in, and the vocal folds are going to move apart. Comme uh, uh, ça as they're, they're breathing. This is a patient with a left vocal cord paralysis. Have a look at this video. So you can see that, uh, come on. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Right, so you can see, as you look at this video, that the right vocal cord, the right vocal cord is moving normally. This side is moving normally. This left side is stuck where it is. So if you just watch the video, you'll see this side stay still, but you'll see this side moving back and forth absolutely fine. Yeah, do you see that? Now, one of the consequences of um, a vocal cord paralysis is that you never quite get the vocal cords to close together completely when you're trying to produce sound. And that means that air is constantly escaping. And with air escaping constantly, the voice sounds breathy. So vocal cord paralysis um, uh, causes a breathy voice. Uh, it also means that you can't cough adequately because a cough, as we said in the previous lecture, a cough relies on you bringing the vocal cords together and then <clears throat> kind of exploding them apart. In this case, you're never getting the vocal cords to close completely and hence the uh, vocal cords are, um, uh, you, you've got this constant air, air escape, but also with the coughing, you can't <clears throat> bring them together to, to explode them apart. So an ineffective cough is one of the things that happens in a vocal cord paralysis. And that means that you can't clear secretions from your chest. The other really very significant problem with having a vocal cord paralysis is that um, you're not protecting your airway adequately. Now, you, again, you remember from the previous lecture that the, the main function of the larynx is to close when you're swallowing so that food and drink doesn't get into your lungs. And if you can't close the vocal cords completely, then there is an opportunity to, for food and drink to go down into the lungs. And that's clearly a major problem. 
So what can we do for a patient with a paralyzed vocal cord? Well, um, the first thing to say is that all patients with vocal cord paralysis will have some voice therapy. They'll see a speech and language therapist because very often you can get the opposite vocal cord to work a bit of overtime um, and they won't need to have any treatment at all. So seeing a speech and language therapist, a voice therapist is absolutely central to this. The, um, uh, the other thing that we do is to investigate why they've got a vocal cord paralysis. You, you'll know that the vocal cord, each vocal cord is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and it's the recurrent laryngeal nerve that's responsible for bringing the vocal cords together. Now, if you, uh, with a paralyzed vocal cord, it implies that there is something wrong with the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So you need to look at the whole recurrent laryngeal nerve and work out whether there's something, something's cut it, if it's cut it's going to be pretty obvious they'll have had an operation or they'll have been stamped in the neck or what have you but then if you if, they, if there isn't an obvious cause for it you need to do scans of the neck and scans of the chest to work out whether something is pinching the nerve or growing into the nerve that has caused it to stop working so in a patient who's got an on, a new onset of a vocal cord paralysis we will be doing scans of the neck and chest to look at the recurrent laryngeal nerve to see whether there's anything wrong with it so when somebody has a vocal cord paralysis, they will always go for some speech and language therapy to try to help with their voice, to strengthen their voice up and improve some of the breathiness, but also to talk about their swallowing, because if food and drink is going down the wrong way, these patients need some techniques to avoid aspiration and, and stuff going into their lungs. Now, one of the things that we often do um, is to inject filler material into the paralyzed vocal cords. So just imagine for a minute, okay, so you've got your normal vocal cords moving apart to breathe and together to produce sound. In a vocal cord paralysis, if one of the vocal cords is fixed, you've got this going on uh, and the vocal cords never completely close. Now, um, it's unlikely that I'm ever gonna be able to make this vocal cord move again. We can come back to that in a minute, but uh, there's nothing I can do right now to get this vocal cord moving again. But what I can do is to push it across a bit so that the good one has got something to meet up against. And so that uh, they're closing the gap when they're phonating, closing the gap when they're swallowing and uh, coughing to make the larynx more effective. So, and, and in fact, what, what we do in clinic now is to inject these patients under local anaesthetic. So this is a patient who is awake and who is having a filler injection into their paralyzed left vocal cord. You can see that this left vocal cord is paralyzed. It's not moving at all. Um, and I've put some local anaesthetic into the skin, I've put some local anaesthetic into the airway to make it numb, and I'm injecting filler material directly into the vocal cord with the patient awake and, uh, and uh, alert while I'm doing it. Um, and this, this technique of doing vocal cord injections under local anaesthetic has been an absolute game changer for us because it means that we don't have to take patients to the operating theatre to have this done. So what you're seeing here is the needle has gone in through the skin of the front of the neck and I'm, uh, I'm looking at the screen in the needle, filling up, which is great. Um, the advantage of doing it under local anaesthetic is that I can get very precise, um, a very precise idea of how much of the filler material I need to put in there in order to get the vocal cords to come together well. Plus, you know, there's the advantage for the patient of the fact that you don't need to um, come to the operating theatre. This chap actually had other problems with his lungs and the anaesthetists weren't happy for him to have uh, any sort of operation. So, so this, uh, for an injection in clinic for him was a really good option. What are the other options for vocal cord paralysis? Well, that those injections, those filler materials, um, often last forever and they don't need anything further done. But if the injection wears off and if the voice slips back and gets worse again, then one option is to do a more permanent operation, which is called a thyroplasty. And a thyroplasty involves, this is done in the operating theater, but a thyroplasty involves making an incision in the neck um, and opening up the cartilage of the larynx, in other words, the thyroid cartilage. So you cut a window in the thyroid cartilage and you put an implant in from the outside. And this is a diagram of uh, an image taken in cross section. So you can see that it's pushed inwards and the paralyzed vocal cord is pushed across. We do this under sedation um, with the patient uh, drowsy and the reason for that is that when you put your implant into the vocal cord you want to partly wake the patient up so that you can hear what the voice sounds like. So these are the skin markings that I've made for this operation. That's the Adam's apple, that's the, the laryngeal prominence. This is the cricoid cartilage um, and I'm going to make an incision around about there just across between the two. Having opened up the skin and made my window in the thyroid cartilage, 
um, I'm now putting an implant. Now in this case, this is called Silastic, uh, which is a block of plastic that you can put directly into the vocal cord. I actually these days tend to use um, um, uh, Gore-Tex ribbon, which is much easier. But this is the, uh, the thyroid cartilage here. This is the window in the thyroid cartilage and the, the, the Silastic block is being pushed into the window. And at this point, we then check what the patient's voice sounds like. This actually is what I tend to do. So I make a cut and I, this is layered ribbon, Gore-Tex ribbon, and it's very straightforward to do from a surgical point of view uh, and gives really nice results. And that's what happens at the end. Uh, you put, just put, a, this is one stitch that just runs through and through. And um, it's, uh, it, that, that scar then heals up very nicely. It's only a couple of centimeters long. So that's what we do for vocal cord paralysis. Um, now I thought just for this last bit, uh, I would talk a little bit about uh, some common conditions, so, you know, not necessarily directly related to the voice, but some common conditions that people often have um, and that I'm asked about, you know, what do I do to, to try and conserve my voice? What do I do about this or that or the other? So let's just start by talking about asthma. Um, lots of people have asthma. Lots of people need to be on inhalers. Um, I think the first question is importantly, do you need to be on the inhaler? Have you been on the inhaler for 10 years and you've not had an asthma review and you're just taking the puffer because you uh, just out of habit? If you have that conversation with your doctor and say, do I need to be on the inhaler? They may say, well, no, actually you don't. You haven't had an asthma attack for the last 18 months. See how you go without the inhalers. But that's not a decision for me to make. That's something that uh, a singer would have, a conversation a singer would have with their GP or with their um, respiratory doctor uh, to make a call about that. If you do have to be on your inhaler, and by the way, if you have asthma, then your lungs are more important than your voice ultimately. So you've got to you've got to treat the lungs. But there are things that you can do to mitigate the situation. So if you are if you do need to be on an inhaler, gargle every time you use your inhaler, because um, one of the things that happens when you take an inhaler is that obviously most of the inhaler gets into your lungs where it needs to be, but a certain amount of it actually sits on the lining of your throat or your pharynx and your larynx as it goes down. And if you're on a steroid inhaler, that means that you've got steroid particles sitting on your vocal folds, and that can leave you prone to things like thrush, laryngeal candida, candida, uh, which, yeah, as I say, thrush. So um, if you gargle, that will help to rinse away any of the uh, thrush any of the candida that's there uh, just gargle with plain water by the way use a spacer uh, so, and a spacer is a, a basically a chamber you you push the uh, you, you squirt your puffer into the chamber and then you inhale from the chamber and that means that it's a much more efficient way of delivering all the medicines to your lungs rather than some of it just hitting the back of your throat if your coordination is correct and as I say, if you're, if you are asthmatic if you, and you're on inhalers, consider laryngeal candida as a cause for your voice problems if you're having difficulties. Right, reflux. Um, now, reflux is very commonly diagnosed. Uh, and the question really is whether it is a very common condition or not. Um, there was a very large vogue for uh, reflux being diagnosed. Uh, around 20 years ago, and seemingly everybody had reflux, uh, whether they had a, a slightly tickly throat, whether they had a voice problem, whether they had glue ear and all sorts of other stuff. And I think the general consensus now is that although reflux genuinely is an issue for a group of people, it is probably not the case that everybody who has a bit of a tickle in their throat has reflux. So we've really stepped back from diagnosing reflux uh, as much as it was previously, but it is still an issue for a number of people. And one of the things to bear in mind is that you may not have the obvious symptoms of reflux. So you may not have heartburn or a taste of acid in the back of your throat. There's this entity called silent reflux where reflux does affect the throat, but in the absence of any of the normal sort of heartburn type symptoms. I cannot tell you whether you've got reflux from looking at your vocal cords. There is no, that's not a diagnostic test for reflux. There are some specialist tests that can be done, but they're quite invasive. Um, and uh, we would tend not to go down the route of detailed testing um, initially because those tests are pretty problematic and, and not the most straightforward to do. So we often end up treating the patient empirically. In other words, saying, look, we think you probably have got reflux. We've got a variety of different things you can do to manage it. Um, try these over a period of a few months. If, you're re if the symptoms are still a problem at the end of that, and if we think reflux is still an issue, then we would talk about you having um, a, um, a, some further diagnostic tests. 
Um, uh, and uh, the, t the treatment for reflux really involves lifestyle modifications. There are lots of different um, uh, uh, websites that can help you out with that, including on my own. I've got a, a reflux advice sheet for patients uh, that you can have a look at. Um, and it, it, the bullet points are avoid fizzy drinks, avoid spicy foods, avoid eating late at night, because when you eat late at night, your stomach produces loads of acid. You then lie flat and the acid then comes back up into the back of your throat and causes problems. And that leads on to the next thing, which is that lying flat can leave you prone to reflux. If you're propped up a little bit, then gravity is on your side in terms of keeping the, um, the acidity in your stomach. Uh, and the, the aim of the game is to keep the stomach contents in the stomach if you possibly can. It's not just about the acid, by the way, it's about the digestive enzymes that are in the stomach as well. So it's not just acid coming up into your esophagus and into your pharynx, it's also about the digestive enzymes. Hay fever, well my take on hay fever uh, is that lots of people take antihistamine tablets and I tend to try to steer people away from antihistamine tablets because they do tend to cause you to be quite dry. So I would avoid antihistamine tablets if you possibly can um, and I would rather that you were on a long-term nasal steroid spray. There are lots of them out there, lots of different nasal sprays out there. Um, uh, you can, I mean, by all means have an antihistamine every once in a while, but I think being on a steroid nasal spray every day for the whole of hay fever season, and then occasionally having an antihistamine tablet if you need it, I think is a better way to do it. Now you might worry about the fact that you're getting steroid, is it going to cause problems in other ways? Well, no, it's not, because it's a, the dose of steroid in the, uh, in the sprays is tiny, and almost all of that hangs around inside your nose. Virtually none of it gets into your system. So I really don't think it's a concern. If you're worried about steroid, in, steroid sprays causing problems with your larynx, then by all means gargle after you've used them, but I don't really think that's terribly necessary. So I would just use a steroid nasal spray and I would then use an antihistamine as and when. So we talked about this afterward. We talked about this before. If you have a sore throat, it's often okay to sing, but if you're hoarse, probably best not to. I'm going to pause there. There is one more lecture to come, which is on hormones of aging and so on in the larynx. Um, my website is www.voicedoctor.co.uk uh, and you can follow me on Twitter if you wish. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, I look forward to seeing you for the next and final installment.